So I'm just going to introduce myself again. Sorry for those who've already heard this. Uh, my name is Sue Sahay MBE. I'm the founder and director of the SEAL Research Trust. And I would like to welcome you to the SEAL Alliance SharePoint session that's going to be delivered by a range of inspiring speakers from around England and Wales. Uh, please would you stay on mute during the session. If you would uh, prefer not to, to be shown on the recording, then please do keep your cameras off. That would be lovely. Uh, we'd love you to put stuff in the chat. So please tell us a little bit about where you are and who you are. Uh, maybe a bit about why you love seals. That would also be interesting. And as our speakers go through, we're keen to keep to time. So we'd like you to put questions as they come into your head into the chat so that they don't get forgotten. And we will attempt to answer them in the chat or answer them at the end of the evening, if that's OK. So I'm going to just summarise what this session is all about, really. For me, its aims are to showcase what member groups have been doing. Uh, it is also to share ideas to inspire other people to take action, because all of us are quite happy for you to pinch our ideas and uh, action them on your own patch. We're always keen to give SEALs a voice uh, in a world where often money talks loudest. And we would like to celebrate the hard work of a load of amazing people, the vast majority of whom are completely and utterly dedicated volunteers. So that's the purpose of tonight. And hopefully the unofficial one is to give you some sealy smiles. That's the, the main aim for me, really. So we're going to start with a pre-recorded talk. Dan Jarvis from British Divers Marine Life Rescue, he's head of conservation and welfare, uh, has been unable to attend tonight, but he has recorded uh, session for you. Uh, what I suggest you do is that it's a video and the volume is a little bit quiet. So if you're able to, please do put the volume up on your computer so that you can hear it OK. The other video that we're playing, the, the sound will be quite a lot louder, but this one you might need to turn your volume up. OK, on that, I will move over and start playing Dan's input. Hi there, my name's Dan Jarvis. I'm the Director of Welfare and Conservation at Rivers Marine Life Rescue. BDMR is a frontline emergency response service for marine mammals in distress around the coastline of the UK. Tonight I'll be sharing some of our headlines and highlights from around the last 12 months or so. Uh, but going a little bit uh, earlier in time than that to August of 2023, our first headline comes uh, from the common seal season, where in August of last year, we had a really exceptional volume of call outs that came in, uh, mainly from the East Coast, where you tend to find them. In fact, it was double the normal amount of call outs we expect to receive in an August, which is usually around 200 to 250. And instead, we had over 400. It's not entirely clear what the reason was for this. It might have been that there were more uh, seals born that season perhaps and there were more casualties as a result or perhaps we just had a really bad year and had some bad luck and a lot of the seals uh, that uh, were being born got into difficulty of one kind or another so uh, we're still looking out to try and identify more clearly what the reasons for that were from the data that we've got uh, but it was a really exceptional time then but thankfully this summer season has been much more on average we've not had any uh, exceptional volumes of call outs in any areas of the country, thankfully. So uh, it's been a much better season for them. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll see that more consistently in the future, or well, at least with only hope. Hey? You might also have heard us reference the mouth rot condition found in common seals as well in recent years. We're very actively investigating that in a joint project between BDMLR, the University of Teesside and the Zoological Society of London. And we've still very actively been collecting samples from over the summer from the affected animals that have been coming in through our rescue work. So a big thank you to all of the vets and surgeries and staff and the medics who have been involved in data collection for this. Those samples that have been collected this summer are going to add to the previous few years worth of data and can join the analysis now to see if the uh, sort of the early conclusions that we're starting to draw, although certainly not definitive at the moment, uh, are borne out by this latest data set that we've gathered. Hopefully in the new year we'll have a new update on the findings from this uh, most recent season's worth of sample collection. Looking at grey seals, and again just over 12 months ago, to the southwest of England this time. In the period between September to December, it really was an exceptional time in the region, with every month a record breaker for the volume of call-outs that we received. 
Uh, we didn't have lots of particularly bad storms that time, but it might have been more down to a general period of long term storminess uh, and rough seas that might have led to a consistently high number of call outs in that area during that period. But interestingly, after the new year, things really seemed to settle down and the volume of call outs actually went to below average. So uh, the season overall looked just like a, a fairly busy one. Uh, but looking at that finer detail, of course, it was pretty exceptional in the first half, at least. The current season, of course, isn't in full swing around the entirety of the UK at the moment, so it's a bit difficult to give a full picture of what's going on. But just looking again to southwest England for comparison, we're just going to describe it as steady in the volume of call outs and casualties coming in for rehabilitation. So perhaps we'll just leave it at that and not jinx things. However, Looking at rehabilitation capacity, this is one of our biggest challenges that we now face. In recent years, a couple of centres have closed. Uh, others have started having to restrict the number of seals they take in for various different reasons, whether it's staffing or funding, or uh, they go down for maintenance for a few months at a time, uh, or even during outbreaks of avian flu, some centres have to close their door to protect other animals they have on their sites as well. So it does provide a really complex and challenging and quite dynamic environment for rehabilitation and finding capacity for seals is becoming incredibly difficult in many regions, especially those where there's no local facilities available. So we're very actively calling out for help, looking for new rehabilitation centres in strategic areas of the country to help with this issue, particularly places like the uh, north and east of England, uh, in Wales and even parts of Scotland as well. Looking at a few highlights of rescues from the last 12 months, back in January, uh, we were able to rescue this adult male grey seal in Cornwall from an entanglement in a plastic ring. This seal is known as commuter and was identified six years ago by the Seal Research Trust and has always been known as an entangled animal and it has taken this amount of uh, patience and frustration, believe me, uh, waiting and watching for him to come up in a location that's both accessible and safe for a rescue to be carried out. And finally, in January of this year, the stars aligned and we were able to do something for him. He was safely caught, the uh, plastic ring was trimmed away, and thankfully the wound underneath was pretty shallow, so that was cleaned up and he was sent on his way. But the uh, item in question, interestingly, turned out to be a paint lid tin seal. Uh, so, like any other kind of looped item, uh, a danger to wildlife. In the summer, uh, and again in the west of Cornwall this time, we had this wonderful little seal turn up and was monitored by medics for a few days. This is actually a ringed seal. It's an Arctic species, not found anywhere near the UK, but we do very occasionally get records of them, mainly in the far north of Scotland. But this is actually the first record for Cornwall, uh, so a really special seal, and it appeared to be in pretty good health. We had no causes for concern uh, about its welfare, um, and we monitored it over a few days. It was in good condition. However, sadly, after a few days, it was being monitored uh, in part of the estuary when it suddenly had a seizure and passed away. So that came as a real shock to us because it had given no indication of having any kind of uh, signs or symptoms of ill health up until then, but we were able to recover the body for a post-mortem examination and the Cornwall Marine Pathology team have been able to do a really great thorough investigation uh, with uh, assistance from the University of Exeter scientists to try and study as much as we possibly can about this incredibly special animal uh, and what might have been the reason it was here, uh, what had happened to it during its life, uh, and hopefully to try to identify causes of death uh, as well. It's unfortunately not been very clear cut on what the cause of death has been so far, but there's been a whole variety of samples taken from it to help us try to understand that. A few weeks later, we then had a second Arctic species turn up. This is a hooded seal, this time a juvenile, and this animal was found in a dinghy in Falmouth Harbour on the south coast of Cornwall. 
Um, it was really a case of right place, right time, because it was only there for a few minutes and someone was able to snap these photos of it before it woke up and went back in the water. It hasn't been seen since, so we don't know if it was okay, if it survived and where it went, uh, hopefully back north to where it should be, but as best as we can tell, it looked pretty healthy and alert in these photos here. And, and finally, uh, more recently, just in October, in Northumberland, we had this little common seal that was spotted struggling in between some boulders. And as our medics arrived to come and check on it, it actually slipped and fell into a crevice between the rocks. So it was incredibly lucky that it was actually seen at all because it may never have been found and met a horrible end. But luckily our medics were able to dig their way through the sand and make a gap big enough to be able to get it back out again. So well done to all of our volunteers involved in these call outs over the last 12 months, anywhere around the country that they've been out looking to, to help these animals. Thank you also to our various partners who we work with, particularly the rehabilitation centres too. And thank you very much for coming along tonight and for listening. So that's really wonderful, fantastic to get an inspirational um, start to the evening with some really interesting seals and some very gallant work by volunteers, uh, particularly the Marine Mammal Medics and British Divers Marine Life Rescue. So over to uh, Gareth Richards from Gareth Seal Group just taking himself a sip of water, so I might as well make him splurt. Thank you very much, Gareth. Uh, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and you can start sharing yours. And don't forget you're on mute. I'll be there. Lovely, we are yeah. there. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, thank you, uh, Sue, and uh, thank you, Dan, as well. Um, well, hello, it's lovely to see. I think there's 34 in this uh, particular uh, meeting so far uh, tonight, and it's great to speak to you all. So, uh, it's hello from uh, Gower Seal Group. Um, just to tell you, we are a small local group of uh, volunteers, and um, we formed about three and a half years ago, and that was in response to the sort of ever-increasing um, uh, events of disturbance uh, here locally. Um, and apart from sort of climate change and pollution, or human disturbance really has been the real sort of challenge for our local seals. And we wanted to sort of uh, head that sort of face on here in, in Gower. Um, I suppose the um, the question is, you know, where is Gower and the Gower Peninsula? But I'm sure you can tell from my Welsh accent that um, we are from uh, South Wales and uh, Gower Peninsula is just outside of uh, Swansea. It's a beautiful location, beautiful coastal location, and it forms part of the, the recently uh, called National Landscapes, which I think there are 46 within the UK at the, uh, at the moment. Um, we face onto the southwest, so it can be quite sort of challenging for uh, our wildlife, especially as the climate change is certainly uh, taking its grip, and we get all the sort of storms from the uh, from the Atlantic. Um, our aim is to protect and uh, sort of conserve our local visiting uh, North Atlantic uh, grey seals, and at the very heart of what we do, it's uh, it's about education and information uh, giving giving. Um, and it's always been that way, whether you're four years of age or 104 years of age, we're quite happy to get out there uh, amongst you. And these are just a selection of uh, some of our 2024 uh, inputs. In fact, this afternoon, I did my 48th talk uh, of the year, and I've got another two left for 2024 as well. But it's just fantastic to get out there and, um, and uh, create partnerships with many local groups there and one of the partnerships that we have struck up is with Swansea University Marine Biology Department um, and uh, I gave a talk to 53 of their students and then about six weeks later they invited me to uh, attend their field studies course with the University of Florida so I was absolutely over the moon apart from one thing it was held on Gower and not in Florida 
But you never know, next year they might be in Florida. So um, it was absolutely fantastic to be able to speak to those uh, students as well. And of course, going into schools as well and presenting our junior and mini seal ambassador programs because at the end of the day you know the young people are our future and uh, you know it was so important to um, uh, to uh, get our message across uh, to them as well but one of the things that we one of the many things that we are very sort of pleased and proud of is um, our working in close partnership with so many different organizations which uh, i must say uh, it's been pulled together by the uh, uh, the start of Gower Safe and Operation Seabird, and South Wales Police and especially the Gower, uh, the Gower Neighbourhood Policing Team have been instrumental pulling this, uh, pulling this all together and to work alongside these various uh, organisations from the Fire Service, RNLI, RSPCA, uh, Coast Guard Agency uh, and the like. But one of the things that we did do um, recently uh, because several of our members, including myself, are a uh, are medics with the British Divers Marine Life Rescue, is that we've teamed up with them. So every time we 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 do attend an event uh, in future, uh, we will be accompanied by uh, members of uh, BDMLR as well, because they are great ambassadors. And uh, you know, at the end of the day, I mean, they um, they have got uh, a huge amount of experience and uh, information to really sort of engage with uh, the public as well. So that's one of the that's one of the things that we've teamed up um, recently with, and it's it's very important for us to share our networks that we've created over the last three and a half years uh, with them as well. Um, but I suppose the um, the greatest local success that we've actually sort of had is um, is raising awareness about the dangers of uh, flying rings. And um, we've engaged with a wide selection of the uh, community uh, and the public. And even as you see in the middle there, Emily, who's my next door neighbour, and she's a criminal barrister as well. But what we've actually done is to make uh, or created a, um, uh, some, uh, a series of short films, which we'll be uh, producing towards the... Um, towards the beginning of next year as well, especially when we put together a petition to try and get a national uh, ban on, on flyer rings as well. But Dan said earlier about um, the damage that uh, was, was done to sort of a uh, commuter as well. And although that was an entangled uh, ring, uh, flying rings cause a huge amount of, um, uh, of pain and suffering as well. You know, to that end, for the work that we've been doing here, i got to say that our local media, the BBC, the ITV, S4C, which is the Welsh language uh, version, and our local uh, talk TV, and that's TV as well, have been absolutely fantastic. And they've had some great sort of coverage. And I've had the opportunity to go on the television a couple of times just to get that sort of uh, message across there. But of course, these media opportunities really reinforced our sort of message because at that particular time and over the previous sort of six months, I've been feeding Swansea Council with information and photographs as well, trying to get them to pursue a voluntary ban on flying rings within uh, the Swansea local authority area. And uh, bingo, on the 5th of September, they did. And at a full council meeting, they voted unanimously uh, to ban the sale of flying rings and also um, encouraging people not to, uh, not to buy uh, the flying rings in Swansea. Um, and I must be honest, you know, I was, um, I've never been so proud, actually, of our local council because it was unanimous as well. Um, so the next stage, uh, well, my next mission is to um, is to get uh, Wales as the first country in the UK to ban uh, flying rings. And uh, three weeks ago, I did a presentation throughout Wales, did it on Zoom to every local nature partnership coordinator and ecologist in Wales with the with the intention of trying to get them to come on board with us. And the the feedback and the number of emails I've actually had. Uh, has been so encouraging. And um, so all I say to you is watch this space because I'm keeping everything crossed. I know what Sue is as well. 
um, that we actually get this um, the, get this ban as well. What I'm trying to hope is is that where we, we where we will lead in Wales, uh, there will be other local authorities throughout the UK as well that will do exactly the same because I know that they have in Norfolk as well. Um, I just want to leave you with um, with this actually. Um, the photograph was taken by a friend of mine on Lundy Island, actually, Tara, uh, Paul Dean. Um, it's a wonderful photograph. And one of them there on the right-hand side is an ex-rehabilitated seal as well, looking absolutely fantastic. But uh, I just want to say that the success is some of uh, small efforts repeated day in and day out. You know, we are a small local group of volunteers, and it's so important to uh, to have these sort of small groups. And many of you are members of small little groups as well, but this, they are so important. I did a talk last Wednesday to a local wildlife uh, trust. Uh, quite an established one, actually, and I, and I won't name it, but it's a wildlife trust. And... Um, Oh, God, I'm so saddened. I was the last ever speaker to that group because they were disbanding. They were disbanding through the the lack of support and the lack of funds to even be able to uh, hire a hall to actually sort of meet as well. And uh, this all happened since COVID. Um, so my message really to all of you, because I know we're all like-minded people on this particular uh, meeting tonight, is it is so important to support your local groups. It doesn't matter how large or how small they are. And it's about those small bits of effort as well, when they are repeated day in, day out, and that perseverance, get a knockback, but just keep at it all the time. It is certainly happening here. The more times I get knocked back, the more I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm determined to get uh, what we should be getting. And what we should be getting as far as we're concerned here, is me giving them uh, our seals a voice. So it doesn't matter what wildlife you are interested in or the environment, we need small groups as well. So please support small groups. And that's it, Sue. Thank you for listening. That's so lovely. Thank you very, Gareth. That's that's really motivating and uplifting to hear as well and very important for us all to know. If not us, then who? We are all important and we can all make a difference. Mm. Uh, so we're going to uh, go not too far away from Gower. We're going to come south a little bit and we're going to go to Lundy Island. And Tara McAvoy Wilding is the assistant warden there. And she's going to deliver the next presentation. Over to you, Tara. Right, I'll just share my screen. Thank you. <laughs> right. Uh... Can you all see it all right? We can, yes. Well done, Tara. Fantastic. Right. Um, so as Sue said, I'm Tara. Um, I'm the assistant warden on Lundy Island. Um, I've been the assistant warden since March, but previously was involved with the island um, doing kind of marine volunteering. So Lundy is home to a big breeding colony of grey seals, and it's a popular haul out throughout the year. If you haven't heard of Lundy before, this is where we're located. So just south of Gareth um, in the Bristol Channel. We're a little bit closer to North Devon. We're about 12 miles north at the closest location. So this is the island. Um, so Lundy is um, important for lots of reasons and a kind of very popular tourist destination for a variety of um, different interest groups. But um, most importantly, I think we're a marine protected area. Um, this surrounds the island and on the east side, we have a no take zone. We were the first statutory marine protected area um, in the country. Um, and we were formed in 1986. Um, the majority of the land on the island is a triple SI, um, and part of this is the Atlantic grey seals fall under this protection because although they're marine animals, they do haul out on the island itself, um, so they could um, thankfully be covered under this protection. During um, peak pupping season, we have around 200 seals living around the island. Um, but at the moment, we're probably more like um, we've dropped right down to probably about 100 seals, I think, at the last count. Um, so the numbers are probably will stay fairly stable throughout the year now until we get into pupping season for next year, um, which starts for us kind of end of July, beginning of August. But it was particularly early this year um, with the first pup, I think, being born probably the first or second week of July. Because of importance as a breeding area, we conduct population monitoring and productivity surveys throughout the breeding season. So there's a map of our kind of route. The majority of the seals like to haul out on the east side of the island. Um, so that's the place we cover the most. 
Um, and we also do kind of regular pup checks to try and keep a track of all the pups born around the island. Um, so this year we've had 71 pups born um, around the island so far, but we're still having a couple born um, probably for the next month or so, but we've really tailed off and we're at the end of pupping season now. So Lundy Island is a popular tourist destination all year round, but um, particularly during the summer months. People visit the island daily on small charter boats, um, boats to predominantly to snorkel with seals, um, which is a very popular activity um, to come if you're on holiday in North Devon. People have kind of advertising stalls on the harbour and um, people can book on a boat for the day and come over to the island and they go for a snorkel with seals. Um, private yachts visit the island um, and another issue we have is that often they land their tenders on the popping beaches. Um, this is um, obviously hard to communicate before they get onto the island so we're trying to change that. Um, on top of this we offer day trips three times a week um, on our passenger ferry the MS Oldenburg which can carry up to 262 people and we can also have um, about 100 people staying on the island at the time. Visitors love seeing the seals, which is fantastic, but often um, they can linger for a bit too long around some of the closer hauled out, um, hauled out pups in the landing bay, which can cause disturbance or delay mums from coming to feed their pups. It's also popular for swimmers, and sometimes people like to swim a bit close to the hauled out, um, the hauled out seals. Um, so that's another issue we have. So um, the main focus um, I've been asked to talk about is charter boats. So you can see in this photo we have um, this is one of the bays in the northeast of the island, Gannets Bay, which um, is very popular for snorkeling with seals. You can probably just about see a couple of little seal heads floating around near the boats. But um, the charter boats are a predominant disturbance, pro disturbance problem for us. Um, and they often cause seals to flush from the rocks, especially as some operators like to target low tide for their snorkels, as they know there'll be more seals around. There'll be multiple boats in the bay often, so as you can see, this photo has four boats in it, um, which means that there could realistically be up, up to about 30 snorkelers um, in the bay at once, which is way too many, and they can get um, a lot closer to the seals than we'd like. The noise also echoes around the bay um, from the boat lifts and stuff, and inadequate pre-snorkel briefs mean that customers um, think it's appropriate to hug seals, try and kiss seals, and um, one of our previous volunteers witnessed someone climbing up onto a rock to try and take a selfie with a seal, which is ridiculous. Um, people coming on these charters obviously trust that the operators and the crew will advise them on how to safely enjoy an experience of a seal and not disturb them. And um, they'd assume that they're kind of experts in this field and are often unaware of the negative effects that they're having. Um, however, the problem we have really is that the customers of these charters are quite hard to reach group because they don't ever really set foot on the island. They come for the, bay, the day from Ilfracombe or Biddeford and then they go home again and we never really see them. One incident we've had this year um, involved a drone that was being flown from a charter boat and it crashed into a popular hall outside um, on the east coast of the island. So the snorkeler got off and then swam ashore to collect the drone and flushed all the seals off the rocks. And you can see I've highlighted the seals in red. So some of them are actually still on the rocks, really close to this um, person. And there's a few that have already flushed into the water. Um, the photographer of this was on a footpath a bit higher up, so he wasn't um, disturbing the seals. We've also been alerted to social media posts, which have shown people snorkeling with seals. Um, and this person's giving a seal a hug, um, or trying to, which obviously is not appropriate at all. Um, and the kind of sharing of these images and videos promotes the bad practice and also make the activity more popular because people will kind of idolise it and think, oh, I want to do that as well. Um, and obviously, I'm sure you're aware of the potential risks this kind of close contact between a snorkeler and a seal has um, for both of them. This is just kind of two of the worst incidents we've witnessed this summer. But over the previous few years, I think I could do the whole presentation on just... Um, negative um, in interactions people have had with seals. So um, what we've been trying to do about it, so to engage with people that actually come onto the island itself, which is a bit easier because we get to see them and chat to hit them and a lot of them are staying on the island so you can chat to them in the evenings. Um, so it's a lot easier to reach them. We've increased signage around the island, which gives key information on seal disturbance and how to prevent it. 
And we also um, supply a variety of the Seal Alliance and Seal Research Group's um, leaflets um, in the pub, which is fantastic. Um, we have an evening talk, which includes um, a bit about Lundy seals, about their ecology, and also how to um, reduce disturbance when you're looking at seals or going for a swim around the island. And um, we've made an effort to have this, you can see the bottom left sign. Um, we put that in the landing bay, which is um, a popular place for people to snorkel and swim. And you can see on the sign, there's a little map, which is the map that I've put in the top right corner, which um, advises people where they should swim um, during kind of pupping season because um, Rat Island becomes a very popular haul out. So we try and ask people to stay away from that area as much as possible. We've also closed beaches um, where seal pups are present as during the rest of the year, seals don't tend to haul out on these beaches. So it's fine for people to visit them, but obviously it, um, the peak pupping season, then pups are everywhere. So we um, close all the beaches as and when um, to protect the seal pups. But as I said before, it's much harder to engage with people who um, come to the island on private boats as they don't often step foot on the island. And um, so this time we've been working to try and improve communications with this group. Um, we updated the Lundy Seal so Code of Conduct um, to try and encompass the key points from a collection of code of conducts that we think were most appropriate for um, the charter boats and their customers. And we tried to make it kind of visually appealing so um, operators would want to display it on their boat. And this was distributed around as part of our new mailing list, um, which includes season ticket holders for the island. So this is made up of boats that regularly visit the island and potentially drop customers for an hour or so. Um, and then also just from us finding email addresses from boats we see with logos on the side that come to the island regularly. Our initial kind of issues of this mailing list included helpful resources uh, on, and some information on the effects of seal disturbance. And then later issues have kind of had a kind of a seal update and then also discussed um, the bad practice that we've witnessed. So, for example, the social media incident and then the when that drone crashed um, at Brazen Ward on the East Coast. So we highlighted the incident, um, but keeping the charter boat company that was involved anonymous and then what we've done about it and also said why it's such a, a negative thing that that happened um, with the idea that hopefully it will discourage um, charters from allowing similar incidents to happen in the future. We also emailed yacht clubs on the North Devon and South Wales coast um, to advise them on where they should land their tenders during the puffing season. So the map you can see on this slide um, is the map we sent to them, um, which basically shows that we want them to land at Christie's Quay rather than the slipway on the main beach, because this is where um, lots of seal pups are. We also discussed the issue of seal disturbance at the Lundy Marine Protected Area Advisory Group meeting. Um, this is a meeting that happens twice a year um, in the spring and the autumn. And um, it's a mixture of um, fishermen, conservationists, um, people that um, have been involved in the Marine Protected Area since it was created. And then all the local charter companies are invited to attend as well and make contributions, which makes it a good place for discussing um, seal disturbance. Um, so since our efforts to try and um, engage more with water users about the issues of seal disturbance around Lundy, um, we've had great feedback from swimmers who have come onto the island and they've asked loads of questions and really been keen to do the right thing and swim in the, the, kind of the areas we've suggested and really follow the guidance, which is fantastic. Um, the yacht mailing list seems to have been a success. Um, because it seems from observations that more of the yacht tenders have come ashore in a desired location. And we also received an email from one lady who had seen our email we'd sent around um, who wanted more advice on minimising seal disturbance, which we thought was fantastic. Um, following the incident with the social media post, um, thanks, um, with, thanks to the help of Sue Sayer, we sent um, a char the charter boat company a direct email to kind of say why their behavior was completely unacceptable and we also copied in natural england who then replied um, to the charter boat company um, to say that they were aware of the incident and remind them of the defra code which we thought was a big win because i think it's quite hard to get um emails out of natural england often in the future we plan to continue our mailing list and hope that we can find a way to engage with these harder to reach um, charter companies as We've had real positive feedback from some charter companies, but some of them have we've heard nothing from and seem very reluctant to engage with us. And they are also the worst offenders. So we're hoping uh, through the coming year we can try to 
um, find a way to get through to them and try and advise them on what they're doing wrong, but also just giving them tips on how they could easily reduce seal disturbance because we understand it's a, a, a livelihood for these people. And in the summer, it's a great business, but um, obviously it's disturbing the seals almost every day. Um, we will hope to continue flagging up both positive and negative behaviours um, that we observe from seal disturbance. So if someone does something good, like, oh, they haven't come at low tide and they've stayed at least 100 metres away, we want to flag that up as a positive um, thing, but also continue to um, flag up the negative behaviours, such as the drone incident or social media posts that aren't acceptable. We've, become, we've begun a relationship with North Devon Biosphere who run a marine wildlife accreditation scheme specifically for North Devon. Um, and we hope to grow this relationship over the winter and become more um, involved directly in the accreditation scheme, as many of the charter boats that visit the island um, are part of this scheme. And finally, um, we're recruiting our SEAL volunteer for next year. So if you know anybody that might be interested in helping us to survey um, our breeding SEAL population um, next autumn, look at the Lundy website for a bit more information. And that's it. Lovely, Tara. Thank you very much. That was great. And what a wonderful role model example of how landowners can do a suite of measures to actually manage people around seals, which is wonderful. I was going to say that Tara is speaking tonight because in 2024, the Seal Alliance Executive expanded their membership by developing, thanks to Gareth Richards, who chairs this group, a new partner group. So Tara is the first representative of our partner group to present at a Seal Alliance SharePoint session. And we're hugely grateful. Thanks ever so much, Tara. Gareth, it looks like you want to chip in a minute. Yeah, I was going to ask you, actually. So I, I just want to say uh, a big thanks to Tara and Joe, uh, Joe, the uh, the warden there. Uh, I was back there uh, on Lundy back in September, and um, they've done a, a significant amount of work to protect the uh, the seals and the pups around there. So I just want to say a big thank you to you, uh, Tara, as well. And don't forget, you may well be on that island, but we're only an email away. <laughs> thank you, Sue. And always very happy to help. So well done, Tara. Always. Thank you very yeah, much. always. OK, I'm going to share my screen now because Matt and me from Yorkshire Seal Group have re pre-recorded their presentation. They are live uh, with us tonight and are very happy to answer questions. I've noticed there are no questions in the chat and I cannot believe however good our speakers are, that there are no questions arising as a result of them. So please put those questions in the chat. And now I'm going to start Matt and Neve's input. And again, uh, they will be here live. Well, they are here live to answer your questions arising from it. You might need to put your sound down a little bit with this one. So just be warned, it's it's a, a larger sound quality than Dan's. OK, thank you. Thanks for handing over, Sue. Um, for those who haven't met us, my name's Matt and this is Neve, and we are the directors and co-founders of the Yorkshire Seal Group. So we're going to take you on a quick whirlwind tour of what we've been up to over the last year and who we are. Before we move on, um, we just wanted to say a massive thank you to, Sorry. to all the volunteers that we have at Yorkshire Seal Group. Um, what we do all along the Yorkshire coastline wouldn't happen without all of these dedicated and passionate volunteers that help to conserve um, the seals. And whenever I say we, it is a collective group of all of us along the Yorkshire coast helping the seals um, in terms of conservation and welfare. Um, what we do, so we have three main aims in what we do at Yorkshire Seal Group. So just a quick summary. Our first main priority is we protect seals. It's across three main sites. We also carry out education and engagement. That's both on-site, protecting the seals that are resting on our shores, and also off-site, so going to education and outreach events as well to raise awareness and change the status quo on how we behave around seals. And also we conduct a lot of research along the Yorkshire coast, which we'll explain in a little bit more detail during our slides. And um, so thanks to Audrey, our data lead, who collects all of the vital information and records to help us influence change along the Yorkshire coast. This year's findings, so just a quick summary, we've engaged over 5,500 members of the public, and that has led to around 1,080 volunteer hours roughly, which has resulted in 250 days covered 
of seal protection along the Yorkshire coastline. We also want to take biannual seal censuses to see what the population is like along the Yorkshire coast for seals. And also this year we have confirmed a whopping 27 tagged seals along the Yorkshire coastline. So that's a record for us in regards to tag seals. So it's nice to see an increase of those from our stewards that are out the grounds. And they uh, vary the length and breadth of the country and also from overseas as well. So we've had tag seals from the Netherlands, from Germany and from north and south, both the southeast of England and also um, the uh, northeast of Scotland. Uh, most importantly, here we have George Biggs. George Biggs was one of our most commonly seen seals. He's been seen four times. He was rescued down in Norfolk by the RSPCA and taken to East Winch. Uh, he managed to crawl a mile in land to a road before being rescued. And he is a firm favourite amongst our team. So we do a lot of deceased seal recording and we're the leaders in the county for deceased seal recording. And we've got a new researcher named Finn. So if you're watching Finn, thanks for the work you've been doing on working on getting our catalogues up to date. New deceased recording form is now available on our website so people can record dead seals they encounter on the shoreline and they can take photos, the species if they know it, whether it's a common seal or a grey seal, the location, and the volunteers will sometimes go out and they'll take further details such as measurements, uh, gender, and the rate of decomposition that they might find the, the seal to be in. We do a lot of work with entangled seals. We monitor all the entangled seals in the area. We've currently got about five or six moving along the Yorkshire coast, which is very sad to see. And entanglement is something quite prolific that we see up and down the Yorkshire coast. Uh, we've got some facts and figures that are displayed on the slides there, but the majority of it is fishing related debris, and that could be ghost fishing gear that's lost or discarded at sea. We've got a quick reference catalogue, which is really, really important, and that helps us so we don't interact with seals that don't need rescuing. And obviously any that are cut free, we can check from the scarring and from the uh, pelage markings to make sure we don't make that mistake again. So we use that as a quick aid device when moving forward with entangled cases. Uh, we've been doing seal ID now since 2019. But most recently this year, we have recruited both Kit and Lynn, and they are remote researchers to help us with um, the seal ID um, uh, over the years now. So they've been really going through the backlog of all the mothers that we've been taking photos of, seeing if we've recited them, for example. So our most recited seal at the minute is Seaclaw. She's a mother that's come back to us since 2020, all up until 2023. And we have yet to report whether she'll come back in 2024. And this year, we're also starting our common seal ID. And um, common seals aren't as common on the Yorkshire coast, but it, it will be good to see how they move along the Yorkshire coast, that 1% of the population that we do have. And um, so in terms of disturbances, um, just a few of the challenges that we face at the Yorkshire coast and also what our volunteers have to face. Um, unfortunately, one of our main sites has a right of way that goes straight through the seal colony. So that is very difficult in terms of um, manage, managing it and having people's expectations and managing it for a seal habitat. Um, it's not a triple SI, it's not protected in any way, so it's very difficult for us. So having people on the ground, just talking to people is the best solution for us. Disturbance because of that is daily and you can see some quite high numbers of disturbance events that happens and also the stampede events and they're roughly the same as last year as well. So we're not seeing an increase or decrease, but we would really like that number to go down a lot. And um, so some of the solutions that we've had for this year, we've created created a new disturbance recording form. So when we don't have volunteers on site, members of the public can report disturbances. And that's for us to gauge how harmful and how damaging it is when volunteers aren't on site. So that has quite a positive um, intake at the minute. And we also receive more funding to do more signs and to do more in terms of engagement and outreach to raise awareness in the issues of disturbance that our seals face. <laughs> We have really high uh, pup mortality at the site. Unfortunately, that's an ongoing trend for us here at the Yorkshire Seal Group. We have a site that's very accessible, so it's possible to walk through the rookery, which is obviously very, very sad. On average, we see around about 50% mortality in our pre-wean pups. So that's pups that are dying in the first uh, suckling period, so the sort of 17 to 21 day average suckling period we see on the Yorkshire coast. And those are a mixture of sources, such as natural things, such as rock fall events. Uh, we had an increase in storms, so Storm Arwen in 2021 did quite a lot of damage and storm frequency is increasing with climate change. But we also see a lot of anthropogenic causes as well, more acute things than climate change, and those are mainly disturbance, people encroaching on the seals themselves. So that's something we try to mitigate as best we can. We also have a lot of underweight mothers, and that's a result of cumulative disturbance at our sites as well. So um, this is just a quick overview for some of the challenges. Erosion is a big issue on the Yorkshire coastline. So it's quite challenging for our volunteers to make sure um, visitors are safe as they're increasing uh, along the shores. And 
sometimes it is a benefit that the footpath clo gets closed because during the winter months and that is does give a little bit of respite for the seals and especially during the buffing season it gives a good respite so we do loads of fundraising and we've got a, a big shout out to claire who's one of our senior fundraisers one of our senior leads also helped by audrey some rather leads and sue and others as well too many to mention on here we also have a great partnership caring for critters which is a charity shop located on Huntress Road in Scarborough, if you get the chance to visit, and we're one of their four nominated charities. The money that we get from Yorkshire Silver all goes straight back into our work as we're very grassroots, and such purchases we made this year to help us with our outreach work included renewing our banners and interpretation work, a project camera, and also some safety satellite pages for when our stewards are on site and out of reach. Uh, we do a little bit of campaigning, so some of our dedicated volunteers went to Restore Nature Now protests and we joined around 80,000 people that were basically becoming the voice for the voiceless and trying to push the parliament for more change for our wild animals um, within the UK. We can do lots on the Fly Ring campaign, which some of you may have heard of from other presenters this evening, which is a national campaign to try and get Fly Ring removed from our shelves. We've had uh, some success with some retailers on the Yorkshire Coast removing them and some promises from others as well. So watch this space. We've also had real good support from councillors. You can see uh, Councillor Phoenix here in one of the photos here, who is really crucial in helping us get it past unanimously through the East Riding of Yorkshire Council. And they've also gone on to then share, as you can see in the right hand picture there on their social media, some of that messaging that we really want to get carried through. So watch that space on Flying Rings. Flying Rings also, just to finish on Flying Rings, we've had some great work with uh, beach artist Fred Brown, and some of you have seen some of the uh, digital work he's done with drones over the area, and these great pieces of sand art are great at just reaching larger audiences, and they're very visceral and very effective. In terms of education outreach, we do as much as we can. We do education both in Scotland, which is where currently myself and Neva base as directors, and we also have education based in Yorkshire as well. We've reached over 350 children in the last three months. We've got another 300 children through our workshops booked in before Christmas. So we're always very, very active with our curriculum linked education roadshows. In terms of what next, what is next for Yorkshire Group, um, we are really striving to get charity status. We would love to have an expanded volunteer network. So if anybody's interested in, in Yorkshire, um, please hit us up. And also we're pushing to get more online education so we don't have to um, travel to schools and it's more accessible for schools to gain that content. And then also engage with some of the stakeholders that um, own the land close to the seal colonies and also some more seal ID expansion. Perfect. Thanks very much, guys. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you very much, you two. You are an inspiration to the rest of us, for sure, and uh, work in very difficult circumstances, given the accessibility of your site. So that's really very well done. Thank you a lot. Uh, OK, I'm going to pass over now to Jenny Hobson, who has been spearheading the Flying Rings campaign since it began. In fact, she started it. So over to you, uh, Jenny. I've I'm just just sharing my screen. Lovely. OK. Well done, Jenny. That's showing. OK. Lovely. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Jenny Hobson. I'm a member of Friends of Forsy Seals, um, which is a charity on the Norfolk coast. And I'm doing this presentation on behalf of Sally and Craig, two of our committee members. This is our area uh, along the Norfolk um, coast. And the seals mainly haul out roughly in the middle of this area. And our rescue team respond to calls for the whole of this area from Munsley in the north to Caister, which is just above Great Yarmouth in the south. But as the same as, um, as the other seal groups, our main aim is to enable the grey seal colony, as well as harbour seals who visit, to thrive. And to do this by protecting them from human disturbance and injury. We do this mainly by wardening and also work with local landowners and the community. And we also care for the beaches and dunes by doing things like regular beach cleans. Wardening the beaches is a huge logistical challenge. We have our main pupping season is over the winter. It's just going, getting going now. And we have up to 60 wardens in three shifts every day on the beaches, including Christmas Day. And this year we started a mentoring scheme to further support our new wardens on top of their foundational training. 
We operate a voluntary beach closure and we rope, up, rope off the paths, which you can see in the picture, um, above the beaches and we direct visitors up to those paths where they can set, uh, view, see the seals and their pups from a safe distance. Generally, people and their dogs do stay off the beaches in the pupping season, but not always. And we get around 120,000 visitors over the season. As you can probably see from the pictures, our beaches on the East Coast are very, very accessible. And this does cause a lot of challenges. The wardens talk to people, telling them all about the seals, so educating and why it is so important not to disturb them. They also do a regular pup count and monitor both seals and pups in terms of injuries, sickness and abandonment. We had BBC Countryfile programme um, highlight, featured the Norfolk grey seal colonies earlier this year and they came to film the National Trust, ourselves and also Evangelo who is the manager of RSPCA East Winch Wildlife Centre. It was a really good programme with lots of uh, good coverage of the seals and it also covered some of the threats that they, that they face, both human and natural caused. And these are just a few examples of those threats. It's already been mentioned by some people. We're all aware that climate change is, is resulting in more frequent extreme weather events. And you can see the flooding top right and a seal pup uh, stranded. This is caused by high spring tides coinciding with storms or gale force winds, um, onshore winds, and is exacerbated on some of the beaches we cover by these concrete um, sea defences, which make it impossible for the seals and their pups to escape into the dunes. We get regular disturbance, as has been mentioned as well, around the coast. And this is a picture taken one summer. And also frequent sightings of seals also entangled in all sorts of human debris. And I took that picture a few weeks ago um, of a seal caught in, in netting. Our rescue team is amazing, like the BDMLR is active all year round. And this is just a, a few examples. This grey seal completely um, completely covered by the sand would have been drowned if, if, if it hadn't been rescued. Luckily, it was OK and could be released onto the beach. And here are some harbour seal pups at the bottom, including one that was named Oddish who were taken to East Winch. Oddish was suffering from severe lungworm. The pups are generally paired up in the centre to reduce stress and then put into a bigger, a deeper pool once recovered to build up their muscles and their weight before release. Our rescue team is also able to capture, to rescue um, some adult seals and there's Two examples here. This is the third vehicle that we've managed to buy through donation. And you can see Cargill, who was caught in a tangle of fishing net, rescued in February and after seven weeks at East Winch was successfully released. And Sally monitored this seal called Ghostbug with a plastic, pink plastic flying ring around her neck for three years before an opportunity arose to rescue her in March. And these seals with this, uh, with the really serious impediments would die of starvation or infection if they weren't rescued. And it's worth noting that it costs RSPCA East Winch between 10 to 15,000 pounds to treat and rehabilitate an adult seal. And it leads on to the Flying Rings campaign and it's just um, beyond my wildest dreams, really, the support that has come um, across the country, particularly through the groups of SEAL Alliance, people like um, Gareth and Matt and Neve in, in Yorkshire and in Cornwall and many other places as well. 
This is just three of the seals that we've had in the last year off the Norfolk coast. Luckily, Hades and Goliath were successfully treated and released, but the seal in the pink flying ring is still struggling in the wild. But we are getting support, as you've seen already, and these big firms have pledged to only stock solid discs, including and some of the smaller shops as well. The challenge is still big with thousands of flying rings being sold across the country. But we're also getting support, and Gareth has given a really lovely account of Swansea Council, and all three coastal councils in Norfolk are, have put up signage to raise awareness of the dangers of the flying rings. And as I think you heard earlier, the petition we launched this year through Seal Alliance was dissolved because of the early general election, but it did give us a dress rehearsal and we realized we would need to do a lot more work to get the, the number of signatures required. So just a break from seals for a minute. Um, our wardens are out in all sorts of weather and get the chance to see a fantastic array of wildlife alongside the seals. And these are all pictures of birds that have been spotted by our wardens and photographed by them. As well as doing the wardening, the wardens do Again, very similar to the other groups, a lot of other different activities, raising awareness, raising funds, um, educating at school talks. We have a lovely education unit, which we can take round to events. And this year we had a French TV company come and interview two wardens. We had to find two that could speak fluent French and we managed to do that. One of our youngest supporters this year is this little boy, Sunson, who, instead of having birthday presents, raised £74 for the seals. And that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, lovely to see everybody here and the interest in the seals. And I did forget to say earlier on, but it has been said before, particularly by Gareth um, and the other groups, that everybody can help the seals by being aware ourselves and talking to other people, um, talking to the shops about flying rings and asking people not to swap to solid discs and also to talk to people particularly about disturbance and why seals um, need to be left to thrive mm. on their own. And a last thank you to Lynn, one of our other committee members who prepares our quarterly newsletter and gave me a lot of this information and, and photographs for the presentation. Thank you. Lovely. That's thank, that's absolutely wonderful. Thank you ever so much, Jenny. Uh, and an awful lot of really positive um, steps in the right direction, particularly to do with flying rings, but also some of the other issues. Uh, thank you. We're now going to pass over to John Arner from the Solent Seal Project, uh, who is going to share some of his survey work from 2024. Over to you, John, you can share your screen. Right, thank you very much, Sue. I'm just sharing my screen now. Yep. Does that look okay? Uh, we just need you to open your presentation. Yeah. See your screen. Here but it comes. Yeah, here it comes. There we go. Lovely, we can see it fine. Thank you, John. You know. um, well, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us this evening. <clears throat> it's wonderful to see so many attentive faces. Um, the Solent Seal Surveys, they're taking place, uh, I'll show you on a map in, on the next slide, in the Isle of Wight, Hampshire, West Sussex area. Um, here we're talking mainly about that other species of breeding seal in the UK, that's the common or harbour seal. We do have grey seals as well, they don't breed in our area. Um, that's not strictly speaking true, there have been one or two grey seal pups. Uh, but none in the area I'm most involved in, which is Chichester Harbour. So uh, we're not a seal group as such, uh, like the Yorkshire Seal Group, a Gower Seal Group. We're just a small network, really, of people who are interested and concerned about the breeding population of common seals. Um, as far as we know, it's the only breeding, resident breeding population of common seals in the eastern 
Channel area on the English side. There are some in northern France, and there's a very small colony down in uh, Devon and the River Dart, very small breeding colony down there. So uh, this is what we're looking at then. Uh, we're mainly counting from four sites in the Solent area. The Bewley River is a new one for 2024. So what I'm going to do really is just bring you up to date with uh, the results of our surveys this year. It's not quite complete yet. I've uh, been held up through illness, so I haven't been able to complete all the data analysis, charts, graphs and so on. But this is as far as I've got at the moment. Um, so we are just so let's start my timer there. There we go. Um, so we I'm based mostly in the Chipster Harbour National Landscape, formerly Area of Outstanding Natural Beauty. Just to the west, we've got Langston Harbour and and then Portsmouth Harbour. There's nobody really working on seals in Portsmouth Harbour. It's a very busy both commercial and naval port, as I'm sure everybody is aware. Uh, what's interesting, though, is uh, we do have seals using Newtown National Nature Reserve on the northwest shore of the Isle of Wight. And also, as I said, new this year, a uh, very small number of seals using the Bewley River. So uh, here we go, then some of the results. This is from Chichester Harbour. And it takes always takes a little while to look at these um these, these charts, I, I've got a black bar along the bottom covering the dates here. I don't know whether everybody else has. Um, whoops, can't get rid of that. Um, but so we can see the dates. You can see the dates, fine. Um, so we do eight surveys throughout the breeding season of common seals. We, of course, record the grey seals as well. Our survey dates are always on low tide neap low water of neap tides and they start on the last neap tide in may and the last survey is the last neap tide at the sorry the first neap tide at the beginning of september so they're two, two normally in between they're two neap tides per month as you can see they are coordinated then across those four sites you need to look at the left hand scale there the vertical scale which gives you an idea of the numbers that we're looking at. Um, when you look at each date, the it's pretty obvious the common seals are the kind of orangey colours, grey seals are blue colours, and the paler the colour, the younger the animals that we're recording. I'm going to come back to that um, when I've shown you a couple more charts like this. So you can see there the peak numbers were in... Uh, July, July the 16th, I think. I can't actually see that date myself. Um, and it's very interesting. If I just use my pointer here, the number of pups that are, are being born, it's very much used to be that we get perhaps the first common seal pup in the very last week of June, and then the others would all arrive during the first three weeks or thereabouts of July. But this year, it's been getting a little bit earlier. It's quite a common story. The number of pups uh, born in June really started to come in a lot earlier. So the, the um, second neap tide in June, uh, we recorded six pups there. So these are just the peak number of pups that we see um, on our surveys. So here's the result for Langston Harbour. There are a couple of occasions when it was not possible to carry out the survey. Um, and that's because Meg, the environment officer over there, she's on her own. There's no backup. And if she's called away or got a very important meeting, um, she just has to miss the count date. So she's operating on her own. Um, but there's another problem there. And I've put in for the first time these grey bars, which are seal species. Um, it doesn't look as though there are many seals there. But if I only included these coloured bars for the actual identified species, it would give totally the wrong impression about what's going on in Langston Harbour. Small numbers. Look at the vertical axis. It goes up to 14 there. <clears throat> but the, one of the problems is the seals are seem to have moved to a 
Creek, which is very difficult to access. None of these count sites, by the way, are accessible from the land. Um, the two of them, Chichester Harbour and Langston Harbour, you have to approach by boat. And in Langston Harbour, the seals have moved to a small creek. And if Meg goes up there in the boat, it just causes complete disruption. So she doesn't want to do that. So she tends to go back to her office after having had a good look around by boat. And from her office window, she can actually use a birding spotting scope to count the seals in the harbour. But right at the top here, you can see she's dealing with a distance of three kilometres. And it's just very difficult to identify seals at that distance. So we're having to just put in the numbers of unidentified seals as well. In Newtown, on the Isle of Wight, Newtown National Nature Reserve, look, the vertical scale just goes up to seven there. But it's become quite an important site for grey seals. And the grey seals, as I said earlier, don't really breed in the Solent area, certainly not in Chichester or Langston harbours, because there's nowhere really safe above the high tide mark where grey seals could have their pups without being disturbed by walkers along footpaths. But uh, at Newtown, uh, or near Newtown, not actually at the Nature Reserve, but uh, not far from, from it, uh, there was one and possibly two grey seal pups born um, over the, I think it was actually the winter before last now. Um, but you can see there that it's also used by some common seals as well, but no pups. And then finally, on the Bewley River, um, this is... Uh, Quite, I've not visited this site, um, I, but I, I do know the Beaudy River a little bit. Um, so it's not as extensive as the other three sites and boats do go up and down. And occasionally just through the normal navigation, they inevitably do disturb a seal or two and make them jump into the water. But very low numbers here. The vertical axis just runs up to four. So what I thought, oh, sorry, I'll just go back one. Um, there was a common seal pup there on the 16th of July, which is uh, very interesting. So it's not just Chichester Harbour that has the pups. But uh, I just put a composite of these four charts together using the same vertical scale so that you can see approximately where these seals are going. And it's quite clear that Chichester Harbour is the main site. There are a couple of haul out sites within the harbour. But nevertheless, the Bewley River, Langston Harbour, Newtown National Nature Reserve, these are all important sites for the seals that actually do use them. Common seal pups, um, we, I do keep a record, or we keep a record of the peak number of seals seen. There were nine recorded in 2024. Um, <clears throat> but this is the peak count, and the peak count is always in July or at least it has been up until now. Um, most of those sea, seal pups are born in Chichester Harbour, but as you can see in the writing at the bottom there, uh, two are born in Langston Harbour in 2022, and one on the Beauty River I've already pointed out in 2024. We never really know how many common seal pups we actually have. So uh, the reason for that is that when they're born, they don't have white fur. They lose that just before or as they're being born. So they come out a rather glossy grey colour. And this is uh, a mother with a suckling pup this year. Um, and I'll show you another one to different animals. I know it looks like the same group of three, but different animals. Look at the hips on the mother there. This pup is really a barrel of fat now. So just as with grey seals, the mother transfers all her body fat or a lot of it to the, the pup. When the we, we count pups, we will only count them as pups if we see them in that sort of situation where they're right next to the mother, uh, either actually suckling or, or literally buying very, very close. Common seal pups will normally space themselves out by one or two body lengths. The reason we do have a bit of a problem with this is if you look at this photo, you've got two potential pups on the right compared with an adult on the left. But if we focus on the two smaller ones on the right, the potential weaned pup here is the one on the right with the clean grey fur. The one on the left is one or maybe two 
years old. It's got older fur. It, we're looking at the middle of August here and it's just coming up to molting. So looking at that pair, I and I, I took this photo specifically to show this, I would say that the one on the right was probably a pup of that year, but you can never be sure. And this is why. Um, looking at this goes back a few years now. This looks like a very clean looking pup right next to a, another seal there that is molting. They're not lying next to each other. They may or may not be related, um, but that could indicate a pup. But look, that's in September 2018. And that is the same seal in September the previous year in 2017. And we know that because if you look at the markings, you can see they're very similar on the two photos. So what looked like a pup with very clean fur in September 2018 wasn't. It was at least one year old. And just for good measure, here's the same seal again in 2019. So that's that's it. That's why we really can only give an idea of the peak numbers of pups that we ever see rather than the total number of pups. A bit different, I think, to grey seal pups. So that's it from me. Uh, just a, a little thank you to the small number of people involved with this. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Over to you, Sue. Lovely. Thank you, John. And I would like to say just how hard it is to do that kind of surveying and produce data like that. On the other hand, it's absolutely vital and critical because it helps us monitor what's going on with the populations uh, in the in different areas. So thank you very much, John. Uh, over to Sarah from South Devon. Sarah is from the SEAL project and has a very different kind of experience of SEALs. Over to you, Sarah. Uh, OK, is. Um... Yeah. I can see your slides at the side. You just need to start your presentation. I yeah, think. is that good? Yeah, that's great. Well done, Sarah. Fabulous. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Sarah. I run the SEAL project in South Devon. So, yes, it feels very different to a lot of the things I've just um, kind of watched. Um, so, yeah, brace yourselves, guys. Um, so, about eight years ago, I encountered a common SEAL, which are very uncommon in our area, uh, in a seawater pool. So, uh, in Brixham, uh, where I live. And so effectively, none of the seals I've ever encountered have ever been normal, to be fair, never wild in the in the true sense. And so from encountering this uh, common seal pup, uh, I then became a medic for the British Divers Marine Life Rescue. And my first call out was to uh, this seal in the, uh, in the other picture, um, a seal with a spear gun uh, spear spear in her back um so nothing's ever been quite normal or quite understandable uh, around here so for two weeks we followed this seal uh, i got called out to this seal around the bay she's alive and well and this is why i kind of i'm slightly obsessed with seal identification because from her markings on the side of her face i know she is alive and well to this day but these two encounters kind of set me up for this kind of like what are what are wild what are wild seals actually all about this is how you think wild seals should be. They should be on beaches, on exposed, uh, remote cliffs and coves, um, inaccessible to everybody. You know, you cough, they panic. You don't do that. You don't get close enough for any of that. You see them on exposed rocks, sleeping, um, enjoying the sunshine. That's not really how we see them. Um, this is pretty much my everyday survey location this is this is how we see most of the females and the youngsters rock up they are not floating on the sea they are actually on girders um, but this is a marina location and, and so this is my normal which having listened to all you guys and seen other locations lately i know this is this is not normal but this is our normal so this is why i kind of this is Everything we've gone through over the years is is fascinating because Sue especially probably did the whole uh, don't do seals in the room in in town areas and all the rest of it because what we see is very different to to many other locations and yes seals are adapting in a massive way to our ever changing world but this is our normal this is my hometown this is a major fishing port this is a tourist area it's a marina it's a harbour. Yeah, at the bottom right hand of this screen are sleeping seals. 
Um, it doesn't seem right on any level, but it doesn't matter how much I sit there and wait for a massive disturbance. They can watch these massive trawlers go past them, welding, blasting their horns, all sorts. They take so little notice. It's beyond wrong at times, but it's our right. So this is as many anybody that knows me this is this is our this is our um haul out area so the um wooden structure around the marina that you can see on the right hand side of this photo is my main haul out site this is now a county wildlife site because we've surveyed this so well it is now the first artificial structure to be given a county wildlife status which we're very proud of it doesn't work for many people, and we've had people come down from Yorkshire and stuff, come and survey with us and gone, oh, you're too close. And yes, we're not within that little hundred meter thing. Don't, and seals, are, if your seal looks at you, you're disturbing them. These seals are hanging out next to people on their boats. It's very bizarre, um, but it, it's, it's also weirdly normal here, um, which isn't normal by any stretch. But this is where the seals come year after year. It's the same seals year after year. It's also new seals year after year. What makes them come in here? We've no idea. They're not chasing the fish. They're not following the fishing boats. It's nothing like that. But they're also clever seals. The tide comes in. They haul out on these structures and they can rest. The tide does not come in and take them away um, or make them go in and get wet when they don't want to get wet. Um, they also don't like the rain, but that's another matter altogether. But anyway, so this is where we kind of survey. This is where we also see when the, the, the wave screen, as it is, as we call it, um, is being fixed. You can see the seals in the circles. Um, they will just lie there while work is going on around them. <laughs> it's not right, um, but this is how they've got used to this location. They're not threatened by things because actually they're probably some of the safest seals in the country. They've got 24 hour security. Uh, they're on CCTV and nobody can get anywhere near them um, unless they're on a boat to which they can be stopped at any point. So they've got quite a cushy little life. So these are our versions of normal. Uh, the seals hang out on boat docks, uh, jet ski bays, pontoons. And this not this is not just in the harbour area that we see. This is in the, the local river. Um, and this is not just grey seals. This is a few common seals as well. So this is kind of like our everyday survey locations to which we, we do a few different locations. And they're all they're often the same seals. Dinghies, uh, jet ski bays, boys. They're all different things, all man-made. We, and this is what gets me, we go to different locations and we see seals doing proper sealy things on beaches and all the rest of it. We don't get to, we very rarely see that. So our issues change. Uh, this is a new one, I have to say. This is a very comfy seal. This is slightly further along the coast um, um, and, and who can stop her from sleeping on here? I'm fairly sure we know this seal. And again, here, uh, this is a ferry. Um, and this is, again, people do not phone us about seeing seals in these locations because it's not classed as abnormal um, because seals are just using these structures, which is this goes against everything most of you have seen and said. Um, if we see this, this is counted as abnormal um, in our stretch of the coast which it isn't and it shouldn't be but we only seal seal see seals on beaches during pupping season and we don't get very many pups so it's a big deal for us so this this is kind of this is one of my most favored pictures but this is um, very unusual to us we have an entangled seal who we have known of since um march 2022 um, and actually, even while I've been away in the last few days, she's been reported uh, locally and again on a man-made structure. It does help us manage her sightings, doesn't help her, us get to her, because even speaking to people today uh, in the last couple of days, um, over the years, they've netted seals on big beaches and things like some of you guys do in some locations. We don't get that luxury because we don't have beaches remote enough or quiet enough or expansive enough for us to have the luxury of chasing a seal anywhere that sh we could get to her. So until this poor seal is, is um, unfortunately um, incapacitated enough to be on dry land, we, we can only monitor her sightings, but we will continue to do so until we can hopefully do something for her. She doesn't have um, a 
a flying ring uh, or a paint pot thing. She actually has a rubber banding that holds the weight down for a gill net around her neck. So actually cl close, it looks like a gill net, but it's actually the rubber banding. So when we first saw her over two years ago, we could see the banding. We can't see the banding now, but thankfully she does tend to hang around. So hopefully one day we may get a chance to help her. This is what we don't get to see. And I know most of you, this is what you get to see. And, and actually, we've seen, I've just spent three days watching beautiful seals on beautiful beaches. But if we get this, this causes more concern than anything else we see around here. Because seals on beaches are just almost alien. And this young juvenile seal did everything right. He came up a beach. He went up above the high water mark to rest and sleep. He couldn't have done anything better. He was just on a coastal path, a dog walking beach and a beach with a cafe. And for a few weeks, he just tried his hardest to be a seal. And that's the crazy part. We don't get our seals to be seals here. They have to learn to be something else. And I don't necessarily agree with it, but I have to do our best to make sure we we can help and monitor the, the situations. This sort of scenario, we have an awful lot of sea swimmers. I am very occasionally one. I have to say I haven't done it lately. But they all see seals in the sea. But when they see a seal on a beach, it becomes a massive thing because we don't see seals on the shore because we only see them on artificial structures. So it's, it, you know, we, it, it, I don't know, it's just nuts. This is what we get a lot of calls about. Probably uh, during the week, I get several calls to say there's a seal doing something weird. It must be entangled. It must be dying or something and they're sleeping and it's crazy and we'll go down I would I'll take any call for a seal I'll go anywhere to to check on a seal but this is what we get this is what people are concerned about because our seals will do this in visible places especially the post pupping mums they tend to get a little bit blase and will just rock up anywhere and just go check me out I'm doing what I want to do and in the last few days we had one little seal who decided she was going to make some boyfriends but of the wrong kind. And she didn't just mess with one boy, she messed with about four. And we got lots of calls. The lifeboat station will now call us because they get lots of calls about it. And we went out to check on this little female who was just making some friends. But this is how our, they, it, our world is infringing on theirs so much that this is what she thinks was a friend for a few hours, you know, or three or four different friends to be fair. Um, but it, it, it unnerves people and, and so we get lots of calls for that but also we do get some common seals and this was our common seal pup of the year we we had a couple um, but this year we just had one and with the help of the local harbour authority and the navy they did their very best to help us keep this newborn pup safe um, and unfortunately she didn't last for more than a few weeks. And again, we'll never know why, um, but we couldn't have asked for more help. And we know going forward that the, that the Harbour authorities will do their best to make sure if this mum needs to come back to that same sort of area next year, we'll be kind of ready to give her some space to do so. So, yeah, we don't get very many comments, but we, you know, this is what we've got to do. And when you think you've seen it all, and this isn't a man-made structure at all, we get common seals up trees. So you never know what your next call out is going to be. So this is why we love doing what we do. We try and educate people, stay away from seals and don't do this and don't do that. And then our seals just do the strangest things. So this is why we love what we do. We're only we're only tiny by comparison of most of the guys that we've just heard talking. And, our, and we do need some help in doing our identifications and stuff. So if anybody really wants to help us, please do. But we love what we do. We've got to, we've got, to, you know, we, we've, I've been to a location in the last couple of days that's got thousands of seals. We think 30 odd is amazing. Um, but we're all doing what we're doing for the right reasons. And we're all doing it because we love the seals and and, and quirky or normal or whatever. Um, I think we, we're we all part of a magical little world and I wouldn't change it for the world. So, uh, yeah, seals up trees. What more do you want? Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. I think that just shows us how imaginative, creative and adaptable our grey seals can be, not to mention our harbour seals, because they do mm. the same thing. So thank you very much. I must apologise to everyone because obviously we are going to go over tonight. Uh, however, we have one more presentation from me. And in order to try and keep to time, I have a script which I'm going to read so that I don't ad lib and take too long to cover. 
So here we go. This is a summary from Cornwall uh, and all the amazing volunteers in Cornwall. So uh, this is the SEAL Research Trust update. We now have 1.8 full-time equivalent rangers who help us with administration and looking after our volunteers. We continue to work hard to change and enforce the law. SEAL Research Trust work with the Wildlife and Countryside Link to create a briefing document summarising the need for SEAL disturbance to be made illegal as requested by DEFRA. Along with other organisations pre-election, SRT created a manifesto as in the bottom left, as was obviously for SEALs. We reported a case where a SEAL was deliberately injured to the MMO and interviews have taken place under caution, but we await the outcome. Along with the other SEAL Alliance members, disturbance data was submitted to the Wildlife and Countryside Link. Sorry, wrong slide. Alongside other SEAL Alliance members, disturbance data was submitted to the Wildlife and Countryside Link Wildlife Crime Report. Marine mammal crime was higher than bat and badger incidents, which will likely surprise most people. Just going to go back a minute. Our volunteers continue to record disturbance incidents, this one involving a single seal disturbed in the triple SI where it is an offence. It was reported as a preventative measure, given that the site would have hundreds of seals in the following two weeks. And here is the data showing that bats and badgers had fewer incidents reported, although more convictions resulting. In 2025, we, sorry, in 2024, we completed 25 consultations, eight Cornwall wide, 14 UK and three globally on a variety of issues. We continue to work with the statutory agencies and my request to Detective Chief Constable Harrison was the need to revisit England's police priority, England's police wildlife crime priorities. Our feedback, uh, sorry, we hosted a visit from DEFRA's SEALs policy advisor and a day long visit from Natural England's Nat national enforcement team. Our feedback to the JNCC about the Sea Mammal Research Unit Southwest England surveys have resulted in a delay in the report being released. Advice was sought by the Mammal Society and Natural England for the threatened species recovery actions. We are collaborating on our local nature recovery strategy and also our marine nature recovery framework as seals are a top 10 priority species. We've worked with Cornwall floating offshore wind recording underwater seal vocalisations. We partnered with Cornish Lithium and Natural England to explore drone best practice. The results lead us to advise a minimum flight height of 110 metres with a minimum flight distance for a minimum amount of time. Raising awareness about best practice around seals remains a priority and we thank Winterwatch and Springwatch for sharing best practice messaging. Along with other SEAL Alliance members, we substantially mitigated the content of this programme before it was aired. We continue to highlight photography best practice, showing people how far away we are when we take photos that look close up. We add stickers to social media photos, as well as private messaging people whose advice could be, uh, could be improved, whose messaging could be improved. We had a wonderful six month exhibition at the Kurt Jackson Foundation, visited by over 10,000 people, and we supported Operation Seabird at the Global Bird Fair, as well as organising three events in St Agnes, St Ives and Falmouth. Our volunteers attended multiple public events and gave face to face talks online and, and online. Our schools competition ran twice and led to lots of schools talks and youngsters getting mini SEAL ambassador certificates. Amazing volunteers continue to send out letters about the need to stop selling flying rings and replace them with solid discs. We've supported the Lou Marine Conservation Group in a pioneering trial using an EcoBlock anchor with a C-Flex mooring and information buoys highlighting best, best practice around an offshore seal haul out. As you know, our new resources in 2024 included our DEFRA Enjoy Respect Protect leaflet, as well as paddle and boat stickers and a photography best practice poster, all of which are available to you for free. And what about seals? 
So Dan has already mentioned the two vagrant species, ringed and hooded seals that turned up in Cornwall. Two harbour seals travelled from Sarah's patch long distances, including Kraken, who swam 250 kilometres in less than 18 days, and harbour seal Kelpie, who swam 300 kilometres in 52 days. We now have 5,643 seals that link the red starred site to all these orange sites across the Celtic Sea, with three links to the Isle of Man and links to two locations in France. In fact, this seal was seen last month arriving from France. When mums have pups on public beaches, we team up with British Divers Marine Life Rescue to set up volunteer pop watch rotors. And data collected on two occasions shows the average feed time for both pups was eight and a half minutes during daylight hours. With fewer feeds on day seven and eight, increasing after that with both pups apparently weaning on day 14. Lastly, one mum wings mated 10 times with Beachmaster Starline, bit of a toy boy, over multiple days and mated once with another male called Flipper Eyes. This is brand new science. We also tried to identify dead seals and this one called Swims showed some interesting information about weed development. We've known her since 2009 at six different locations and what started out as an apparently insignificant injury developed over time into a flesh eating wound that likely contributed to her death. It was very, very nasty. Another seal who made us smile in 2024 was adult male horn caterpillar, ID'd since 2001, but seen much less frequently since 2015, and who has now defected from the north coast of Cornwall to the south. I thought you would like to see this birth sequence, filmed by fantastic volunteer Martin Yelland, of a mum who was waiting to pup, which looked like a red football, getting interrupted by another female who she understandably got very cross with before finally giving birth to a pup in a clear amniotic sac, which completely disappeared as soon as the pup rolled over. What a privileged sight. Two other interesting behaviours included kelp, this seal here, sleeping at the surface whilst breathing, you can see the bubbles, uh, and before sinking down to the seabed and continuing to sleep there. Also, Fat Four, who was seen feeding these two different pups of different ages. Please remember that we're an independent self-funding charity, uh, relying on wild seal supporter adoption schemes, our Jumble Bee fundraisers, we currently have a jewellery one until the end of this month, and our one-stop online CD shop. We've got some great gifts for Christmas, including this book, Excuse Me, written by, excuse me, are you my mum, written by Rob Wells. It's our first book that we have self-published. It's a wonderful story of a seal pup overcoming nine different challenges, but with a feel good, very happy ending. Thanks to all our volunteers who are utterly amazing and to you for your interest in seals and for listening. Thank you very much. OK. I'm going to stop sharing my uh, screen there. We do have some interesting comments and questions in the chat. What I'm going to do is say thank you very much for joining us. I'm sorry we've gone a little over time. I'm going to stop recording, but we are going to stay on for a short while so that you can answer those questions and hopefully get some answers to things that have been interesting you.